So you, you get these things that could create a credit, credit crisis. History says that it takes four years to repair that. A recession, it can last 13 months and it's over. So, and it does a cleansing uh, of, of, of uh, weak industries and it makes some changes. So I, I'm really just don't, I'm not concerned that we're going to see um, interest rates go 200 basis points above the CPI number. You're listening to IBKR Podcasts. Find more conversations at ibkrpodcasts.com. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Hello and welcome to IBKR Podcasts. I'm Stephen Levine, Senior Market Analyst at Interactive Brokers and your host for today's program. We'll be speaking with Frank Holmes, CEO and Chief Investment Officer at U.S. Global Investors, about his insights into the health of the retail sector in today's economy. Uh, welcome, Frank. It's great to have you here. Thanks for taking the time to do this. It's great to be back. <laughs> really great. Really, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so we've recently had a lot of retail earnings come out. Um, year to date, the retail sector ETF down about 25%. Uh, that's around twice as much as the S&P 500 index. And uh, this is, the country's re remained gripped at you know, high levels of inflation. There are manufacturers suffering through what appears to be their, their toughest business conditions in, what, about 13 years. Uh, consumer sentiments near all-time lows. This is all really concerning, um, not just for retail, but, but really for overall growth. Um, I'd love to get your insights on the sector's prospects. So, you know, I, I suppose, you know, we can start with, how did we get here? You know, why are we seeing such struggles in your view? Well, we believe that government policies are precursor to change. And one of the things we've noticed since 2001 has been this sort of propensity by the G7 countries to use MMT, modern monetary theory, to solve every problem. And each time we go through a global event, it, the amount of money is not the same as the last time. It's two to three times the amount of money to solve the problem. So we continue to see fiscal policy, which is tax and regulation, and monetary policy is real interest rates and money supply. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is, is a growing regulations and growing money supply to try to keep the engine going with all these regulations. And regulations are, are needed many times, but they're quite often outdated and they need to be streamlined of anything. And throwing more money at it, cheaper money, it just creates this backed up inflation. Since 2000, it's hard for people to grasp this, but gold is almost three times greater in performance than the S&P 500. Yeah. The largest the largest hedge fund in the world, Ray Dalio, has had 10 to 15 percent in gold throughout this period. Uh, and so I think it's this imbalance between monetary and fiscal policies, relying too much on MMT. And then you come along with something that's also external and massively disruptive. COVID. Yeah. You know, it, it and and COVID has a sort of it reminds you in history books of the 70s. A lot of the investors today do not remember the 70s. They were they were kids. Yeah. Uh, they weren't listening to Stephen Wolf, Born to Be Wild. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it, it it wasn't their world. Uh, uh, Marvin Gaye uh, singing beautiful songs about uh, a Vietnam War. Uh, that 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 person doesn't relate yeah. to that world. But those who grew up in the 70s understand inflation. And the big disruption there was the um, oil crisis of, of the OPEC of basically spiking the price of oil, which created this incredible inflationary binge that took place everywhere. So mm -hmm. that disruption of the oil embargo reminds me of COVID. It's something external. The demographics of most of the people have never experienced this and how they adapt and adjust to it. And then what I'm seeing now out of travel is, is what I like to call the Zoomers. There's one million Zoomers out there that work from home and they actually want to go and travel and do their work from Cancun. Yeah, they they know all the cheapest flights. You see, uh, JetBlue taking over Spirit. Why? Spirit dominates the Caribbean inexpensive flights. Now all of a sudden, JetBlue uh, takes over the whole East Coast of the Caribbean. 
Yep. If people want to get out of New York and Chicago, they're going to fly down to Florida and then go to the islands uh, because you have a million active people looking for uh, tourist travel, but they're working from these hotels. It's really, it's one of those unexpected consequences that came out of COVID. Yeah. You know, you know it's really interesting when you bring up, say, uh, inflation uh, having been driven by uh, oil in the 70s, for example. Um, and a lot of people, and I hear this a lot in terms of, you know, our inflationary backdrop today um, as being uh, a culprit of, say, geopolitical uh, unrest between Russia and Ukraine or the war between Russia and Ukraine uh, and, and oil or energy spiking uh, a great deal. Uh, also supply chains, and I hear that a lot as well. Um, but the question mark that I, I seem to have here is, you know, you can have certain goods that are um, affected in a lot of goods, you know, by energy. But that may not necessarily translate to, say, all goods and services. And you bring up this great point about modern monetary theory um, and the money supply. Um, and it seems as though our money supply has really maybe been the culprit uh, for inflation, um, given that it has just increased dramatically with um MMT, uh, I believe. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case, but you know, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts there because it, it seems to be that this might just be the backdrop for retail, but but I'm not sure. Well, there's another factor about government policies, and and it's something that's been imported into America, even with all the uh, difficulties with passports and people can't move money easily or move people around. We've been basically buying into climate change policies from Europe. Yes. Yes. And, and, and those climate change policies are, are very driven by emotional extremism. And research has come out that a lot of it is funded by the KGB. Uh, we know in the U.S. that yeah. Matt Damon did a movie on fracking is bad, uh, but it was funded by Gazprom. Oh, really? So, I, did, I didn't know yes, that. That's... If you watch the end of the movie, they'll tell you. Another big anti-fracking movie uh, was funded by the government of Qatar. Why? Because they're the biggest exporters of LNG. And and so the the, the policies, you don't hear the um, uh, the Swedish girl screaming all the time about climate. Work, yeah. Yes, yeah. you don't hear her because it's been a disaster in Europe where your, your utility bills are up 7 time 700 percent increase in the cost of your monthly electrical bill yep. uh, because they prematurely shut down all the nuclear reactors in germany and spain uh and and putin yep. try to have and he's been funding ngos who then turn around and call uh, they can get they're, they're much easier to get to the media and a classic example of that has happened in america and that was uber Uber hired all these lobbyists to go into cities and to see the town hall and all the taxi cab, the license of medallions are controlled usually by one or two families. It was an oligopoly in every city. And so naturally they took care of all the politicians. So you never could get a new entry into it. So they funded an NGO, um, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And they came in pounding the table and immediately the politicians and the media backed away and in came Uber. So yeah. what we're seeing now is a lot of clever funding uh, by using NGOs to carry a proxy and can also be very manipulative like out of Europe. So the climate change policies of trying to wipe out the use of carbon period and the timeline was not written and really orchestrated by engineers. Like you just cannot have 70% of the world on some form of carbon. And, and the idea of let's kill a million cows because they fart too much. <laughs> you, know, that you, you can see this backlash in Europe in particular. And, and uh, it was a million sheep supposed to be slaughtered in the British islands. So, these are very disruptive. What I do know from shipping uh, is that the, the ships, all of a sudden, they they removed 25% of the ships that could come into harbors unless they had these types of controls on them. And so after COVID came out and there's a big binge buying, there weren't enough ships. Yeah. Uh, the whole and, regulatory and, backdrop, I understand, it has not uh, been very flexible or conducive for uh, large swaths of, of business sectors. And so, uh, yeah. so, but we a lot of this stuff comes out of the EU and the UN. So the EU and the UN and the policies on shipping came out of the UN. Um, and so they're just not coordinated globally. They're not thoughtful globally. 
uh, on on you know this idea of better policies. I have the opinion that we need more innovation uh, money spent on solving this problem. Uh, and, and biodegradable fans are talking about now uh, for wind power. Uh, we, we need to have this sort of concept rather than excessive regulations. Yep. So what you can see is that's inflationary. It's basically embedding the DNA of of inflation into all these regulations globally. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's 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 a very very different kind of backdrop. It seems from. Uh, at least what I remember from the seventies, it just it's 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 gone very far extreme uh, in these directions. But you know, if we if we look more specifically, say against this backdrop and into retail, because um, we had a lot of retail earnings and they seem to be all over the map. Um, and you know, there are a lot of firms that have revised their forecast lower, and I've noticed that um, Macy's, Best Buy, I think. Um, TJX companies, I think that's the owner of uh, TJ Maxx. Uh, uh, notably, we, we just saw uh, Nordstrom pretty recently cut its full year forecast and its stock went down, I mean, it really plunged like around like 19% or something um, after it released its results. So, um, I mean, are you concerned at all about any defaults in this sector um, among consumer discretionary companies, among retailers, um, or perhaps maybe you know the inability for higher yielding companies to to be able to access the debt markets? Well, I think that there's no doubt. Can they can they enter the debt market uh, with enough free cash flow uh, to service the debt? Uh, I think the economy is 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 pretty resilient, and and it doesn't it's not going to stop this recession. Uh, what really greatly concerns me is the data points that have come out in the past few days, in particular, something we follow because we're known for the world of commodities and gold, uh, and, and that is PMI, Purchasing Manufacturers Index, or the ISM. Uh, and what we saw in June, uh, sorry, not in, in August of 2020, it was the PMIs collapsed and they came right back. And that meant all the money spending, the economy was going to turn around in six months. For your listeners, Purchasing Manufacturers Index is a wonderful uh, 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 headlight of where you're going. GDP is behind us, so you can't drive your car staring out the rearview mirror. You have to look where we're going. So we at U.S. Global use this PMI and write about it every month because the correlation to oil demand, to copper, to to uh, all the metals is is between 60 and 75 percent correlated. And that means when the one month is below the three months, it means six months we're going to get a slowdown. When it goes below the magic number of 50, that means recession. So the world is actually contracting now. Mm -hmm. that, that, the U.S. was holding the world up, and it's just now actually it's gone negative. And, and that tells you that uh, everyone will start tooling down with their forecasting uh, the economy to grow at. So I think some of the Macy stores and places like that, that's, that's more challenging because they carry much bigger debt loads. Yeah. Um, I think that some of the other supply lines that uh, distribute products, et cetera, they're in a different position. Uh, what we did in our research we found was discretionary goods, a luxury, the luxury end, they actually are more resilient. It doesn't mean they're not going to cut back and doesn't mean they're not going to de decline, but they're much more resilient of, of that catering to that top 10 percent of the population income earners. Well, you know, this is interesting to me because I'm, I'm curious about how high up in the high end retailers um, or luxury retailers uh, you might be thinking about. For example, I mean, in 2020, we saw some higher end retailers go out. We saw uh, Neiman Marcus. We saw Brooks Brothers. Um, I think even uh, among some of the more mid-tier or higher mid-tier uh, retailers like Ralph Lauren or Estee Lauder, um, they've cut their forecasts as well. Um, so, I mean, is it is it like a, a bifurcation on the extremes? Are we looking at a sort of barbelling of retailers that will do well on the high-end extremes uh, and discounters on the other end at the extremes? Well, I just came back from Paris. Okay. And, and you just wouldn't believe uh, on on the high-end Hermes and Chanel, people are lining up outside, not because of COVID, because mm -hmm. the st staff inside can't handle. Uh, and, and so there, there's the something there there's, that you're ah. right. The, the bifurcation is quite significant. Uh, so I think from that end, uh, uh, we're going to see this bifurcation continue. 
And and what happens always will be closer as we get, go this will be the discounters will do the best. The dollar stores will come back. You know, the we had a big run up in in discretionary goods, um, and I think that uh, they'll correct, but nothing to the degree that we're going to see um, the mid tier. The mid tier is going to have the difficulty. Oh well, so I mean, so these 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 could be. Uh, perhaps extended uh, forecast, maybe not just for their next quarterly reports. Uh, companies like Macy's or Nordstrom, uh, Nordstrom Rack, I suppose, uh, as part of that, they seem to have a lot of built-up inventory and just not a great deal of demand uh, for that inventory. And, and so, yeah, they're they're experiencing some some lower sales, uh, anticipating lower demand. It's it's a very fashion conscientious crowd, not only from you know the technology you're putting in your hand to look cool. Uh, it's it's also closed. So by the time all that inventory got across the Pacific Ocean to the shores here and got through uh, uh, Newport's uh, uh, port and, and, and trucked over, it's out of fashion. It's not cool now. And <laughs> yeah. uh, and and so we do see we do see that. But one of the interesting parts in our research is that shipping is going to actually it's much more resilient uh, in their in their ability to pass on. Uh, in one of my other businesses, I noticed like DHL passes all energy costs on to you and any insurance costs, you have to go and get your own insurance. So one of the other businesses where we're shipping products that are worth more than $5 million, we can't do that in one day for, for insurance reasons. So we had to buy separate insurance, capped at $5 million a day uh, to be able to move products. And, and, uh, and all that before, you could just turn around and buy that very easily with DHL. Oh, wow. And and so you see they 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 have de-risked themselves. That's the operative word I'm looking for. Yeah, that's I mean that's and so these costs that are being passed on. I know you you mentioned shipping earlier uh, and regulations to adhere or comply with uh, I suppose UN requirements or or UN. I guess I don't think they can require anything, can they? Or I mean they've got certain policies that it looks like they're passing down to ensure that. Uh, there is uh, climate friendly, uh, I suppose, uh, types of policies in, in the shipping is, is what I understand. Uh, they don't have they don't have the authority like uh, a regulator would have in the U.S., but they do have the ability of tremendous moral suasion uh, mm -hmm. if you get enough ports that have to agree to it. All I have to do is get you know one. It's an oligopoly, so you just have to get one or two, and away you go. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of always view this framework, and, and I could be wrong about this, but I view this framework as the UN has set out a certain uh, sustainable development goals, these SDGs, and they speak to very uh, ideal types of concepts. They, they talk about um, you know, no poverty in the world or no hunger in the world. Um, and, and this is what they're trying to achieve. And I think these got filtered down into the Paris Accord or the, the climate agreement uh, between all these companies that signed, the countries that signed up for it. Um, and so now the governments of those countries are making good on promises that they made there. And they start to enact um, what basically the UN is 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 uh, suggesting we do or recommending uh, for climate uh, change, um, combating climate change, uh, and so a lot of that you know filters into I suppose you know uh, social projects and and then fixed income products that uh, uh, agree with these, and so all of a sudden you've got a lot more um, social projects or uh, environmental projects um, that are debt funded or um, or the, the government just, uh, you know, comes out with, with some spending plan for, and I think the modern monetary theory, as you, as you uh, mentioned earlier, is, is part of that. Um, but you laid all this out already in the beginning, and so it, it makes a lot of sense to me now that these regulations on the shipping side um, would come into play um, from those countries that might be part of that uh, Paris Agreement and that want to see that these products are... Uh, 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 or, or, or this mode of transportation is, is aligned with what they're saying they're doing. I'm not sure. And then we get then we get uh, Putin invading Ukraine. You see, yeah. that just adds to it. You know, it, 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 it just shows the risks and it exposes. So Ukraine is a big exporter of not only food and fertilizer, uh, also gas. And, and a lot of the policies in Europe were actually positioned that they had to rely on Putin. And now they have to go and, and fight this. So you, you can see this disruption is, is, 
is a global phenomenon. The other part is with data. You know, the one thing I learned from the airlines industry with our Jess ETF was is at the very bottom, the TSA started reporting how many people they clear a day. And, and before the crisis, it was 2.7 million a day. Two million Americans traveled every day. That fell down to 89,000 oh, on God. April the 15th in 2020. Now, that's the fact that they start printing that, it became a sentiment indicator. So as it went through the 50-day moving average back to 200,000, 300,000 people cleared a day, you could see the airlines starting to climb. Yeah, And you can see the anticipation. So now this world is very much sentiment driven. And when I was meeting with the utility companies in Sweden, uh, they were commenting that that they don't have a problem of energy pricing, uh, supply demand and surplus water issues, et cetera, in northern Sweden. But the sentiment of the fear that's happened in rest of Europe puts the prices up everywhere. So that's inflationary. If the sentiment if people that they have to buy something fast now because it's going to go higher, that becomes embedded in the DNA of people spending fast now. Yeah. And that's what, that's the biggest risk that we could have here. Uh, yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's daunting. It really is. Um, and you know, if we, if we look, if we take a look at this and we take a look at say the trajectory of catalysts, uh, for example, you know, uh, how this could play out over, it, it's so difficult to, for me at least, to, to, to see ahead with, with all the uncertainties and in, in, in the directions that cat, these catalysts could go. Um, but, you know, I, I understand consumer spending is what, like about, comprises about two thirds of uh, our, our GDP in this country. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a that's a that's quite a lot of concentration on consumer spending. Um, I'm not sure what the state of really consumer spending is is exactly, but as I'm seeing these re, you know downwardly revised forecasts, I'm thinking, and and, and the way that consumer sentiment has been um, drawn up by say the University of Michigan, et cetera, um, it doesn't look good. Um, and so what does the growth? And we've already had two quarters uh, of contraction, so. What what uh, how do you see this unfolding um, in the next year or two? I mean, are, are we going to continue to contract like this? Yeah, yeah I think we're going to have an, a, a classic recession. It's not going to be a global crisis like 2008 or going back to 2001 where you have this global event take place. This is a rising interest rate, slowing down inflation um, uh, recession. And, uh, and and it'll probably have some you know health. It'll have some good benefits. Uh, it, it's we've seen trying to hire people. They don't show up to work. It's called ghosting. Uh, they show up to work and and uh, they uh, restaurant owners were telling me here that that um, the that these young kids refuse to go outside because it's too hot. Yeah. And and and, <laughs> yeah. and and they were you know that's it, it's it's severe like uh, danger and risk to them uh, that that work ethic. So recessions are probably healthy to uh, wake up people. But right now, if people quit a job, it's in the service industry still. It's easy to get another job, and and I and I don't think that we're highly leveraged like we were in two thousand and eight. Uh, if we go back on real serious global recessions, it's always a credit crisis where the the uh, industry or a category was over leveraged. We can go back to remember the SNL crisis we had. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that brought down real estate uh, in 84. Uh, sorry, that came out in 86. So Charles, and that Charles phenomenon Keating, took, was that Charles Keating, I think? Or, no, not Keating. It was well, he exposed it. He was he was a flagrant uh, user of the SNL money, but he and a flamboyant guy, and they went after him. Okay. Uh, but it takes usually four years on a credit crisis. So 2008 crisis, uh, it wasn't really till 2012 that we saw the global economy turn. If we go to back to 97, um, that was the Asian crisis, uh, a credit crisis where Japan lent all this money and people bought built buildings with it and they wanted their money back and they couldn't do it. So there was a currency devaluation. A credit crisis like that, four years. 98 uh, was Russia defaulted on all their sovereign debt. Yep. Uh, and we had during that period, long-term capital. Yeah. So you, you get these things that can create a credit, credit crisis. History says that it takes four years to repair that. 
a recession, it can last 13 months and it's over. So, and it does a cleansing uh, of, of, of uh, weak industries and it makes some changes. So I, I'm really just don't, I'm not concerned that we're going to see um, interest rates go 200 basis points above the CPI number because that would that would create a credit crisis. So that means it, we'd have to have 12% interest rates right now. Yep. That's what happened in, t- in 2000 and 1980 right. when Volcker came into power, he jumped them 6% above to br- br- sorry, break the psychology of inflation. Um, and I think this gradual increase we're seeing that people are cutting back and, and we're going through that normal cut down. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I do hope that, uh, you know, it works out. <laughs> I think that everybody hopes it works out um, and that uh, we don't uh, have a prolonged period of pain um, from the recession. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, I'd, I'd love to get your take on on what you think investors in the retail sector should be watching out for over, say, the near to medium term. I mean, what is it that, you know, they should be looking at when they're deciding to invest in something retail, whether that's uh, let's say let's say just equities. You know, that's a great question. And there's two ways to look at that. You can look at financials, but they're always looking back. And is there a momentum? I, I, I think the simple thing is in 2020, I remember that everything shut down. And but I had to drive to the office and there's a Lowe's right across the street from us. Yeah. Everything was empty except for Lowe's. <laughs> Holy well, jumping, what's going on you know, here? What's going on? We had to do this research. And Home Depot, all of a sudden, that parking lot was packed. Uh, but the supermarket was shut down. You had to go to a discount place. So then when all of a sudden we saw everyone, all the workers that were doing renovations, people were stuck at home. They started doing all these renovations. Yep. And uh, <laughs> Amazon trucks were everywhere. So the only thing you could see driving in your neighborhood uh, actively were the Amazon trucks. <laughs> so you have to be observant. And, and it's not your normal f- financial analysis of looking at stuff. You just have to go and observe. Yep. And you can see something happening. A lot of it sounds like common sense in a way. I mean, it it, it does, and in, in, in sort of doing the math of your environment. Yes, and, and and looking for what's the hottest selling thing. See, there's lots of data points that come on the internet for that. Yeah. If that's what you, if that's how you want to use it, but you you have to look for that momentum, and and it should correlate quickly with the stocks because I'm a big believer in James Sirwecki's book called The Wisdom of Crowds. Okay. Uh, and uh, in that research, he did that if your interests may be different than my motivation, but we the motivation we both want to make money. But what motivates you and how much you expect could be different than mine. But we'll turn around and make a decision to buy this stock or sell it. And if you get enough different people with, with different interests to buy that, that average price is pretty accurate. So if if the Homes Depot stock was was rising and I could just see that the parking lot was full, uh, something's happening here. <laughs> and and it's it's this sort of thought process. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, um, you know, I'm 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 curious. I, I, I just, uh, you know, when I when I look out at the landscape, you know, and I see a, an ETF, you know, taking a bet on um online companies and the demise of brick and mortar stores doing better than um, some of the other retail ETFs, for example, um, or retail, you know, I, I start to, you know, start to become nostalgic for what was in my environment and wonder, you know, how things are going to go forward. Um, for example, malls, I mean, th- there's just a, a ton of uh, of 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 sadness it seems when you think of malls um i saw some pictures of kohl's recently i think that there was an article on yahoo finance uh and somebody went out and took pictures of of uh, inside kohl's um and it just looked like a very depressing scene um and none of this is what i remember say back in the 80s when you walked around malls and they were very vibrant and, you know, it was the place to go and you had movies like, you know, Fast Times at Richmond High or, or, uh, or, or others. I mean, by the time I think Mall Rats came out, things were starting to slow down and now it's YouTube videos of touring uh, desolate locations where, you know, people without, uh, people who are dispossessed live. It's, it's very, it's very nostalgic. And so the whole retail sector to me just seems like it's, being hollowed out. 
Um, and so do you think that this bifurcation or this uh, barbelling is something that we should learn to live with going forward? Well, I think that um, a lot of these buildings you're talking about, they're, they didn't keep up with the with renovations. And and I think there's a great you know, piece of research going back over 20 years ago to Harvard called the Experiencing Economy. Uh, and and people go for a good experience. Yep. So if you're not updating the, that, that environment that you're going to, like you said earlier, the malls were vibrant. Well, they were vibrant. And and they and they had a vibrancy with lighting. They had a vibrancy with fountains. Uh, they would have music, etc. So they have to update themselves with with something that's new in technology. So I think that a lot of companies failed to spend enough money entertaining people. Yes. They if they're and drive in a car, get the kids out, go through the mall. Like what 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 creates this vibrancy? What makes it a great experience? I do believe that people do want to go through racks and people do want to see things, um, but they want a, a, a great experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's definitely true for for my experience, at least personally. I mean, I, I love to go to stores and have that experience too. And if if I go and I pick up something and I want to buy it and I go to a register and there's nobody at the register, uh, then I can't buy it. You know, if I have to hunt somebody down to ask them, hey, uh, you know, could you please ring me up? Uh, you know, it becomes a very difficult situation and you start to think, well, maybe I should just buy it online. Um, and, and maybe that's just the mindset or what's fueling the decisions these days. It's unfortunate about the malls. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe we'll have uh, uh, some better experiences going forward. Uh, I hope this, again, doesn't fuel a prolonged bifurcation. I hope we do see a return of vibrancy to these uh, stores that are uh, suffering. Um, but um, Frank, this has been terrific. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, to, to tell listeners or, or to yeah, watch out for? Yeah, I, I think it I think that, you know, you'll have to be looking at having gold as part of your portfolio and rebalance each year. Um, uh, it, it, it's it's far outperformed, and that rebalancing has done what you should do in diversified portfolio, uh, because the money printing when the panic buttons hit, it's going to be uh, another run at MMT. That that has that has not broken, and I believe that following geopolitics and geo uh, economic factors, uh, the G20, G7 countries meet all the time. They've gone gone to synchronize. Uh, corporate taxation with the G7. So they'll go to synchronized MMT if there's a panic button hit. And, and that's where you start to really see gold uh, shine. And it, it does, it's great for a diversified portfolio. Uh, it's terrific. And it's and something, you know, certainly people who, um, you know, might be experiencing some uh, difficulty, you know, who, who haven't done that, uh, you know, uh, should take heed, I suppose. It, it, that's, uh, that's great. Um, Thank you again, Frank. This has been really, really great. You're welcome. Um, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, listeners out there, you can read more market commentary analysis and insights from U.S. global investors at IBKR Traders Insight at tradersinsight.news. Uh, they've got a lot of fascinating articles there, uh, delve into gold um, and precious metals, emerging markets, travel. Uh, as well as cargo and shipping, uh, a lot of uh, what we've discussed on this call today, uh, as well as global resources and more. Um, and until next time, I'm Stephen Levine with Interactive Brokers. Thanks for listening to IBKR Podcasts. As always, we have more episodes at ibkrpodcasts.com. And if you're interested in learning more about Interactive Brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education material, such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, financial and economic commentary at tradersinsight.news, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. Any discussion or mention of an ETF is not to be construed as recommendation, promotion, or solicitation. All investors should review and consider associated investment risks, charges, and expenses of the investment company or fund prior to investing. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, as necessary, seek professional advice. Futures are not suitable for all investors. The amount you may lose may be greater than your initial investment. Before trading futures, please read the CFTC Risk Disclosure. A copy and additional information are available at ivkr.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political 
applicable conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and is necessary, see professional advice.